Following on our series that we kicked off end of last year, we are coming back to the lab data, all about science of endurance here, looking at the data from testing in the lab, my data leading up to my 70.3 in 2019. What are we looking at today? We're looking at how I established the five training zones. If you think back to last year, we did talk about how to identify lactate threshold and the four key methods that are associated with identifying where someone's lactate threshold is or where the anaerobic threshold is, all the same thing. Go check that one out. I might link it above and down below. But today we're going to go through all the other training zones I use. I use a five zone system. So I'll break it down nice and simple, show you step by step how I take lab data, turn it into training zones to the end, be able to prescribe and implement appropriate training for the individual athlete. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Hey, welcome back to the channel. Nick here talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Great to be back and first video for 2021. Had a great year last year, really getting the channel kickstarted and absolutely awesome to have enough support on the channel to reach over two and a half thousand subscribers. Couldn't have done it without your support and without people clicking that big red button. If you haven't and you're enjoying the videos and you're new to the channel or you're watching for the first time, you've been keeping up to date with the content, whatever it is, if you haven't hit that red button, go hit it down below right now. Subscribe to the channel keep uh, supporting what we're doing here, building this great community. Go check out Instagram as well. We got very close to a thousand followers on Instagram at NJ underscore sports science in the bottom corner here. Head over there, some different content that pops up there, more of my day to day, some thoughts that I have, my own training if you're interested in that. We're very close to a thousand followers over there. It'd be great to continue to grow the community across both platforms. And it would be uh, remiss of me if I didn't mention the join button down below. If you want to support the channel above and beyond just uh, subscribing, to, uh, subscribing to the channel, liking the videos, commenting, etc. You can join as a channel member, part of Team NJ, uh, Team NJ Sports Science. It's going to be some new perks dropping in the membership very, very soon. So for a small little contribution, you can help me upgrade the channel, make some better quality videos, better equipment, things like that, uh, and keep things ticking along. So really do appreciate the support, but without any further ado, let's get into today's content, which is all about the five training zones that I use with athletes. So we have talked about previously, and I mentioned in the introduction, identification of lactate threshold is something that I, I've taken you through in depth. And so I'm not going to cover that as much. I'll, I'll obviously show you how it fits into things. But today I want to show you the other parts of it. And it really does kick off and start when we go back to our data with, well, how do we establish, if we're looking at five zones, how do we establish zone one to begin with? Because that's really, that, that's really, I guess, the first thing I always do is when I look at the data, I establish where is, first and foremost, VO2 max. And we've already identified that uh, as this bolded line uh, across the bottom of the screen here. You can see uh, at 19 and a half minutes, at 270 watts, this is remembering back is my bike test pre going into my training program. So I actually had a very low base on the bike. Um, 270 watts is actually a reasonable amount of watch for me, but in terms of some of these zones, and I'll explain why uh, they're sort of down in a moment. But I always identify VO2 max first, and then I look at where is my active recovery? Where is uh, where is that part of, of my physiology where anything below that, I'm not gonna get an aerobic stimulus. And this is what, I really, well, what I'm really talking about is a zone one here. Um, I, I call it a zone one because again, we're looking at a, at a five zone system, but it's really anything less than approximately between 50 and 56% of VO2 max. And really, I try to use 56% as much as I can because that's the American College of Sports Medicine's identification of what is considered an active recovery for majority of athletes and majority of people. But in this circumstance, uh, because I've got such a low base and in athletes who have quite a low base and their active recovery is very close, if I use 56% of, of VO2 max to find that, it gives me 130 beats per minute. And when I get to zone two, you'll see that that's very, very close. How do I actually establish that is I look at this graph here. So we know the relationship and I've talked about a few times when I talk about VO2 max in your Garmin, the relationship between oxygen consumption and heart rate as exercise intensity increases, incredibly linear. You can see this R squared value that I'm circling now uh, is the, the correlation. How close are these blue dots of data points to this black uh, line of best fit. 0.93, very, very close. What does that mean? I can use this line and I can use this equation here, the Y equals um, equation here to be able to predict a number off this chart. So what I'm, or, or anywhere along here or potentially below or above the upper end, it gives me a good ability to predict that with reasonable accuracy. It's not gonna be hundred percent, but it's gonna be very, very close because the correlation between these variables is very, very good. Or the relationship between these variables is very, very good. What do I need to do to get 56%? Well, I take my VO2 max. So I take my absolute number. If I come back here, 3,841. I've already done the maths for you. So I'm not going to step that through on the screen. But I take 3,841 
multiply it by 0 0.56, so 56%. I then put that in as X. Sorry, I put that in as Y. I've got that back to front. <laughs> got back to front. I put that in as Y because that's this is our Y axis here. I'm trying to. I found where's my VO2 max? It's somewhere in here, three thousand eight hundred, where my my mouse is circling now. So it's somewhere. It's basically here. I now need to find X, which will be my heart rate that associated with, associates with VO2 max. So I've created that fifty six percent that aligns with somewhere across here. I solve for X, so I basically add fifteen hundred and seventy four point two, and then divide by twenty eight point four six five will give me 119 beats per minute. 119 beats per minute or lower is therefore my active recovery zone. So if I scroll back through and have a look where that falls, 119 beats per minute is at the three minute mark here and it's at 90 watts. Perfect. Anything less than 90 watts for me, I now know is my active recovery. Anything slightly above that, I'm going to start to get an aerobic benefit. We don't really benefit from, particularly in my circumstance here, I'm not going to benefit from doing anything lower than that heart rate other than just flushing the legs out. It's not going to give me that aerobic stimulus I need to be able to improve from an aerobic capacity perspective, change any of the physiology or the, the infrastructure in terms of the muscles um, and how well I use option. It's just going to help me flush the legs out. So I know that's what that purpose of that session is for. Then we're going to move into a zone two. So now we're starting to talk about how can I get an aerobic capacity benefit? How am I going to build the Ks and the legs really effectively? And it comes down to basically this top end of active recovery. So where I've hit 119 beats per minute, 90 watts. If you like that 50, 56% of VO2 max, I've used 50% of VO2 max my active recovery because we're then going to VT1 slash LT1. So the first inflection in ventilation um, that, go, that we start to see a change, more importantly, it's typically around 2.5 millimoles of blood lactate, our first clear accumulation above resting. Resting is anything between really one to two millimoles. And you can see here, zero, uh, zero watts, 1.7 at rest, 2.2 millimoles of blood lactate. So it's barely changed. Comes up a little bit, but then after this 150 watts mark at 2.9, it starts to increase a little bit more. And that's, that's our first real clear change beyond that. So this last intensity here, 150, I know that's gonna be my LT1. Or, or VT1 is going to match up with that as well. I go and have a look, 150, what was the end of that stage? It gives me 133, 134 beats per minute. It would be the nine minute mark. 133 beats per minute. It's this one here. 134 was just the one second average we took at the time of the test. This is a 30 second average in that period. So 133 is probably a little more accurate. And that becomes my zone two. So my zone two now, therefore, and I hope you can see that. I've just realized it's just covering a bit. Um, my zone two is then 119 to 133. So I know at that heart rate, I can go build the Ks in the legs really well. I'm going to get a really good aerobic stimulus. I'm not going to be producing too much blood lactate to get inhibition. So I'm going to get that really good building base Ks into me, which is really something I needed. Now, the importance of using 50% of VO2 max as my active recovery is because this point here actually falls about 58%, which is quite low. So at 58% of my VO2 max, that's the top end of my long, slow riding, my base Ks riding. Ideally, we want to get that up close to maybe 65 or 70%. I've seen some athletes get it up to sort of 75%, but not too much higher than that. Really, 70% of VO2 max is probably where I wanted to be at. And that's pretty, probably pretty similar to what I would have seen in my post-test once I'd trained for sort of 12, 14 weeks. That's where I'd like to see that get to. Probably similar heart rate in and around the 130, maybe getting up to 140 a little bit because I'm just a bit more comfortable on the bike. Um, and I hadn't done a lot. I'm background is running, then swimming, and then cycling as my weakest. So... In this first test, I hadn't done anything on the bike in, in the better part of a, a six to eight month period. So very low base, go away, work on that long, slow heart rate. That's just going to boost everything up. And I can cruise along at 133 beats per minute and, and feel like I can sit on that all day. But it's that good muscular endurance, that good aerobic capacity. So that's how we get our zone two. We then move into, and, and as you'll notice, these zones just flow on from each other. So our zone three, I like to call it a tempo slash threshold. I kind of combine everything into one to keep things simple. The first half is more tempo. The second half is more closer to our functional threshold or lactate threshold. So you can see here, anything from the top end of zone two, so VT1 or LT1, all the way up to our lactate threshold. And if you remember back, uh, we talked about this graph off that lactate threshold and identifying lactate threshold. We talk about that point in around here. I might actually bring the screenshot um, up. This is just overlay. You can see that clear deflection um, away from the general trend. So quite linear initially. Um, we can see that black line, that red circle is where things start to change. We get a disproportionate increase in ventilation for our oxygen consumption. There is our VT2. Where does that match up with? It also matches up with our LT2. Uh, so if we have a look here, the 210 mark, you can see we're starting to get two millimole accumulation or, or two millimole change here, which is what we like to see in blood lactate. 
but we see a more clear, a greater than two millimole change in this next one. So I'm more erring the side of here, and the VT two point backs up this 210 watt mark. So what I end up coming out with, um, you actually see this probably a little bit higher because the average I think comes back down to about 160 if we scroll down. 210, 30 second average uh, across that stage was 163 beats per minute. Uh, at the time, my heart rate must have been fluctuating. I must have been fiddling around with the strap at the time in the test. Might have caused a little bit of a spike. But see, 163 beats per minute as an average in that last bit is my threshold heart rate. So I use this zone in a couple of different circumstances. When I'm talking about, um, I need to bring this off the screen so you can actually see where I'm pointing. Um, <laughs> this is where my threshold is, that 15 minute mark. And it actually sits at 80% of my max, which I'll get to in a moment. But I use this threshold zone, um, the bottom half of it. So really that 133 to about 150 odd beats per minute. 155 is more of my tempo. Race specific, I bring it in late in the program just to get that specificity in the legs, a bit of muscular endurance and just tolerance to what I'm going to be racing at, particularly if I'm looking at, this was for a 70.3 prep. So I want to get that feel of sitting on a good good intensity, maybe just above my very comfortable pace, um, but I'm not going all the way up at threshold because I'm going to blow myself up if I do that. So it, it's really just that sort of comfortably hard, if you like. It, it's a bit of gray zone and that's why I don't do too much of it. I do a lot more in and around at threshold, so the upper part of this this zone, uh, working close to the lactate threshold and even just slightly above, which then starts to tap into zone four. We get some really good development of our threshold qualities, of our ability to go for uh, 45, 20 hour, but also just punch a little bit higher power for a little bit less blood lactate uh, overall, which is ideal. Boost up the percentage of the engine we, we can hold, which is what we're really talking about here. That is zone three. Moving into zone four really is then everything between threshold and then where VO2 max is. So our zone four is anything above our lactate threshold. So above that point that we, we talked about in terms of this point here, all the way up to our VO2 max at the end. Very easy to identify this line that is highlighted at the moment uh, that I'm sort of circling is our lactate threshold. This is my VO2 max. So it's anything between 163 beats per minute and 183 beats per minute. If I just get this one off the screen so you can actually see that you can see there 183 beats per minute. In terms of wattage, it's anywhere between 210 and 270. So at this point in time, my threshold was at 210 watts, which sat at 80% of my total VO2 max. That's reasonable. That's okay. If I was to go and look at this and go, all right, what could I improve? Definitely, I needed to bring up the bottom end. So that fi that zone two was at 58% of VO2 max. Need a much bigger uh, base. So I need to go away and do the long slow. If I was looking at what types of intervals I might have done, I could have gone away and done some threshold-based intervals to start with because we can still move that. 80% of VO2 max is where a threshold sits. Isn't massively uh, isn't massively up there. It's actually quite low. A lot of athletes get closer to 90, 95% uh, when they're reasonably well trained, race ready as well. So I could have gone away and done some more threshold based intervals in and around that FTP just below, just above some over unders, um, some eight minute on, four minute off or um, any any type of session like that. Running wise, maybe like a monofartlex, a good one. But what I decided to do instead was focus on the VO2 so I could boost up the top end of my engine. Try and get my max from 270, close to 300, 330. So it gave me room to bring my th my threshold up just instead of just going from maybe 210 to 240, maybe to 245, 250 later down the track as well. We'll get some indirect shift, which is what we ended up seeing happening. So overall, not too bad way I decided to go the, the VO2 path, which is all about this zone four, as I put up on, on the screen um, before. It's all about threshold all the way to VO2 max. And we're talking about working really, really maximally. If I bring up this FEO2 graph, if you remember back to the video, we covered how well we use oxygen, this tails off quite aggressively. So I wanna get all this down. I wanna get all these points to be a lot lower, breathe out less oxygen so I can use the most, so I'm more efficient. What does that mean? I can go harder and faster for longer. To do that, working up and as close as possible to VO2 max is ideal, 95% of VO2 max, maybe even 100% of VO2 max or anywhere between really a minute to sort of four minutes, maybe five minutes if I'm stretching it, um, typically with an equal work to rest ratio. So you get good quality recovery right up there really hard and then back it right off, maintain the quality of the effort and repeat that high intensity interval style to get a really good effect. Where we then start to go after here, well, what happens after VO2 max? Well, I call this a bit of an anaerobic zone. Now, it's it's not probably a strictly correct definition because bang on, bang on VO2 max at 100% is included in this zone technically. But really, we're looking above VO2 max now. Anything above, for me, 270 watts and 183 beats per minute, I'm going to know I'm going to have a high anaerobic contribution to my energy production. You can see here, blood lactate at 10.7 at the end of the test. It's only going to go up if I go to 300, 330 watts. So we're now talking about 
maybe some sprint interval type work could be useful up here to get a good aerobic benefit. We can do some sprint interval type training, one to five work to rest, like 10 seconds on, 50 seconds off. That 10 seconds on is as hard as you possibly can go, maximal effort. Maybe some 30 on 30 off. You might've tried this. I know it's a really good session. Uh, cyclists love it a lot. 30 seconds on at about 110% of VO2 max. They'd be close to, so to getting close to that 300 watt mark in this circumstance. Um, 30 seconds off pre, at sort of like 120, 150 watts, just keeping the, the legs turning over up and down, repeat that 10 times, a couple of minutes break, and then go again. Good session again for getting at good VO2 stimulus. You can go above VO2 max and still get a benefit. You just have to shorten the effort up and it just kind of balances things out. So it's all sort of high intensity interval training at this point. If we are looking at maybe something a bit different, if we're looking at repeat sprint, that's a different component. I don't really spend too much time on that for endurance athletes. For the stuff I do at the moment with my football umpiring, yes, uh, repeat sprint is a component of what I do there. But for triathlon purposes, it's not really a component I'm, I'm interested in. So the anaerobic stuff is majorly to get a really a different stimulus from my high intensity interval training uh, other than sort of long intervals, it more taps into the short interval side of things. So that really sums up, I guess, the five training zones. I know I raced through it fairly quickly, but I just wanted to condense it and show you my process of going through, how I get active recovery, how I get my long, slow base type Ks, my endurance type work and what type of sessions I do there. What do I do from a tempo and threshold perspective and why I merge that into one zone? VO2 max, the high intensity interval training aspect, and then what happens anaerobically and some of the types of things I might think about as sessions in that zone five. I use a five zone system. By no means is five zone the best system or necessarily the worst system. It's just what I use because I like it. It's simple, it's effective, and, and I have clear ideas of what the different sessions mean and what the different zones mean. If you use a seven, if you use a three, if you use a nine zone system, it doesn't matter. Whatever works for you, you just need to make sure you understand why you have those zones what each zone's purpose is and that adaptations we're going to get from performing sessions or work in those zones. Once you know that, you can implement the appropriate training at the right time in your training program. You're going to be absolutely flying. So hopefully you got a bit more of an insight in terms of how I do it and a bit of an extension uh, on talking about lactate threshold, how I identify the other zones. As always, any questions, please leave them down below in the comments. Happy to help, happy to talk further. Look forward to another live stream where you can bring those questions in, maybe talk about it on there. Looking forward to joining you on another one. We're going to have one uh, tomorrow, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Melbourne time is what we're going to stick with for now. We might have to change in the future uh, with a few other commitments coming up, but we'll stick with that for now. Looking forward to get back into, back into those. As always, continue to subscribe to the channel, share these videos. I really do appreciate the support. I'm going to leave it there because I've already talked a bit today. That is it, and we'll see you in the next one.